Well, if you recall, or maybe you don't recall, the last time we were together, you may have noted something in the, in the lesson last time. We were looking at Mark chapter 8, and uh, a lot of versions will include Mark chapter 9 verse 1 in the same chapter heading, if you will, of Mark chapter 8 verses 31 through 38. Yet, for whatever reason, I stopped at verse 38. Then you may wonder why. Well, in Mark 8, 31 through 37, uh, Jesus begins to teach his disciples what it means that he is the Christ. Remember, just before this, Peter has uh, told him that you know, when Jesus said, Who do you say I am? Peter says, You are the Christ. And he begins telling him what, it, what that means with, as it relates to his forthcoming death and resurrection. But then in verse 38, he references his second coming. And then we read in Mark chapter 9, verse 1, And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. There are a few in the scholarly world who say that this verse is referencing the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, others say that it's talking about the day of Pentecost or perhaps the resurrection. But these are all some, somewhat, we might call them minority viewpoints that contextually sever chapter 9, verse 1 from chapter 8, verse 38. Um, so uh, uh, there's little doubt in the scholarly world that chapter 8, verse 38, where Jesus talks about being ashamed of him uh, then if we're ashamed of him in this generation, then when he comes, he's going to be ashamed of us. There's little doubt that that's talking about his second coming. So, many people believe that Jesus was actually predicting his second coming in chapter 9, verse 1. And that, uh, that, that, that it would happen prior to the death of, those, of some of those who were standing there. And if that is the case, then Jesus was wrong because he didn't return before or within the lifetime of some of those standing there. And from the looks on some of your faces, you agree with me that that is a totally unacceptable conclusion. So some scholars got together and they said, well, you know what? Maybe he was talking about his second coming, but... It was a conditional prophecy. Even though the conditions aren't given to us, it was a conditional prophecy. And what's a conditional prophecy? Well, think back to the time of Jonah. Jonah prophesied in the city of Nineveh, if you don't repent in 40 days, your city is going to be destroyed. Well, what happened? They repented, didn't they? And the city wasn't destroyed. Was Jonah wrong? No. It was a conditional prophecy. The condition was met, and so therefore the prophecy did not take place. In this instance, they said, well, we weren't told, aren't told what the conditions are, but it was a conditional prophecy. The conditions weren't met, and so therefore Jesus wasn't wrong. He just didn't return before the lifetime of those standing there was over. Suffice to say, that's somewhat problematic. If you, if you, I mean, most of the time when the conditional prophecy is given, we know it's conditional because there are conditions. Uh, this one doesn't have the conditions, and so it's a little problematic. But anyway, another popular view is that chapter 9, verse 1, is a reference to what takes place in chapter 9, verses 2 through 13. The transfiguration where three of those standing here were given a preview of Jesus in his coming glory and an assurance that the kingdom of God had come with power. So the context of chapter 8, verse 38, favors either the second coming view, although only the second coming view that has the problematic conclusion that, well, it was a conditional one that we don't know the conditions of. But uh, anyway, th th 
that, that would be the only way it could re- reference the second coming. Or the transfiguration as a preview of the second coming view. Now, having solved the riddle of this exceptionally difficult passage in about two or three minutes, let's turn our attention to Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 13. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses. And they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were all terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved son, listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. And they asked him, Why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And how it is written, how is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come. And they did to him whatever they pleased, so it is as it is written of him. What I want us to do this morning. Is, look at, is to break this story into two sections. And the first section is what takes place on the mountain in verses uh, 2 through 8. On the mountain of transfiguration, as it is often referred to, the three disciples beheld the majesty of Jesus. They beheld the majesty of Jesus in two ways. First, they beheld the majesty of His person. This is evidenced first by his transfiguration. If you look at Matthew's account of the transfiguration, you read in Matthew 17, verse 2, that his face shone like the sun. Luke's account in Luke 9, 29, it says the appearance of his face was altered. Mark doesn't necessarily tell us anything about his, uh, his physical features as far as his body goes, his face shining or anything. We can assume, though, that it did. There was some change involved. Mark does tell us, though, that his clothes became radiant. In fact, he adds, brighter than anyone on earth could bleach them. I say, well, why is that such a big deal? Well, the bright, radiant, white, shining clothing is actually, in the Old Testament, characteristic of the heavenly world. In fact, when we're told about angelic appearances and we're de- and, we, and th- we are described what the angels are wearing oftentimes it is bright white clothing and so forth and, and so th- this this sort of transmit transfiguration is is not just of his face shining like the sun but his clothes become heavenly we might say but it was also evidenced by the presence of Moses and Elijah. And Moses and Elijah show up and they're, they're, they are doing something very significant. They are talking with Jesus. Mark tells us that. If you look at Luke's account, Luke chapter 8, 9, verse 31, we find out that they were talking with Jesus about His coming departure or death in Jerusalem. Remember, Jesus has just started talking to His disciples about his coming passion, his coming death, burial, and resurrection. And now here's Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus on the mountain about the, the, his coming departure, his coming death. That's the significance that they're talking with Jesus, the significance of their appearance with Jesus. Well, some say that they were representatives of the law and the prophets. Moses the law, Elijah the prophets. And, and a lot of times we're happy with that simple definition, except... Elijah was not a writing prophet. And so he's not the best representative of that part 
of the Old Testament. Now, a lot of stuff is written about Elijah, but he didn't actually write any of anything about himself or his prophecies. Uh, so, you know, we, we could, it could be that, but there's, uh, there, there's some doubt associated with it as well. Some say it was because both experienced theophanies, that is, appearances of God, on a mountain. Remember Moses experienced seeing God on a mountain? And, and Elijah, when the, the, the great and powerful wind and, and everything went by him, and then that gentle breeze, and he pulled his cloak up over his face because that was the presence of God going by. Well, um, uh, and that's, that's possible as well. But a better suggestion, I believe, is that both were associated with end-time expectations. Uh, Moses in Deuteronomy 18.15 said that God would, rise, would raise up a prophet like him. And that would sort of usher in, and Moses being raised up ushered in the uh, Israelites being, uh, becoming a, being a nation and being God's chosen people. And the prophet like him would come that would usher in a new era. And that that would be the, 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 the end era, uh, the end of time era, and so forth. And uh, Malachi 4, verses 5 and 6 predicted the return of quote unquote Elijah um, um, <clears throat> uh, coming in and, and turning the hearts of the fathers to their children and children to their fathers, making some changes and, and so forth. Well, uh, Actually, the disciples are going to bring this up on the way down the mountain. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about Malachi 4, verses 5 and 6 in just a few moments. But they beheld the majesty of Jesus first in his person. And second, they beheld the majesty of his coming kingdom as well. This was evidenced by the voice from heaven. Now, we've got to talk about Peter for a moment, okay? Peter wants to honor Jesus Elijah and Moses. He wants to honor all three of them. I mean, they're, they're all terrified. And so Peter speaks. I'm, that, that just fits with what we know about Peter, doesn't it? I mean, he, he doesn't know what to say, so he says something anyway. I mean, right? Uh, but uh, and some of you are saying, yeah, that sounds like somebody else I know too. I don't know. So anyway... Um, the, the, they, uh, the, they're there on the mountain, the, and, and Peter says that, and it, it's, it's almost instantaneous, I believe, that a cloud envelops them, adding more to the confusion of the disciples and probably the terror of the disciples because that cloud clearly represented the presence of God on that mountain. You say, whoa, that's a big leap. Where'd you get that from? Well, if you look back at Exodus 19... The Israelites are camped at Mount Sinai. What happens to Mount Sinai? A cloud comes down and covers it. Moses goes up into the cloud. There's a lot of stuff going on with the cloud to the point that when Moses comes back down, they say, no, 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 no. We, we don't want any more of that. You go and you, 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 you talk to God and let God talk to you and you come and tell us what he said and we'll believe you. They're terrified of it. And so, so here's, here's this cloud coming down. And then the voice from the cloud says, This is my son. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. This is very similar to another occasion on which God spoke. The baptism of Jesus in Mark chapter 1. Except that on that, in, that occasion, he says to Jesus, You are my son. With you I am well pleased. Here, he says, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. So it, it's the evidence first is about, of the, the majesty of his coming kingdom is the voice from heaven. The second bit of evidence is the absence of Moses and Elijah. Did you notice that? Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter says something, a cloud comes down, and all of a sudden Moses and Elijah are gone. Some say that this signifies that God would now speak through Jesus. Of course, uh, and, and not the law or the prophets, which, you know, if, if you believe that Moses and Elijah were representative of the law and the prophets, it helps with that interpretation and everything. 
Or it could quite simply just mean that Jesus is superior to Moses and Elijah. That when God appears on the mountain of transfiguration in the form of a cloud, and God speaks and identifies Jesus as his son, the others disappear. See, you remember Peter's suggestion? Well, we need to put up a tent or a, a shelter or a tabernacle or depending on what version of the Bible that you have uh, for, for Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. But Jesus is all that matters. Moses doesn't matter. Elijah doesn't matter. Jesus is the only one that matters. And so uh, once, once all this happens, the cloud is lifted. No one's there but Jesus. And so they begin coming down off the mountain in verses 9 through 13. That's the second part of the story. Coming down the mountain, Jesus gives them a command. It's a command that he also gave to uh, one like it to various people that he had healed. He had also given a very similar command to those supernatural beings, those demons that he had driven out. And that command is simple. Don't tell anyone about this. But here it's a little bit different. He says, until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. See, the, uh, the, this is an important part of the messianic secret theme of Mark was that now they're beginning to get it. They're beginning to understand. They know he's the Christ. They know a little bit about what that means, but they still don't totally get it. And so he puts a, puts a, puts a timetable to it. Presumably, this is also when the disciples would be able to proclaim that he was the Christ. Remember back after Peter's confession of Jesus, Mark chapter 8, verse 30, Jesus strictly charged them to tell no one about him. So presumably after the resurrection, that was when they could begin to freely tell people about Jesus because then they would know what, not only that he was the Christ, that he was the Messiah, but what that meant and how he was glorified by God. Now, they follow these instructions. A lot of times when Jesus told people not to tell, they did anyway. In this instance, we're told that they kept the matter to themselves. But they're wondering about it. I mean, since they did not reckon with Jesus, uh, Jesus' coming death, the idea of his being raised from the dead would be difficult to understand. And so they do something fairly smart for a change for the disciples. And that is, they ask Jesus a question. And no, notice they don't ask him about what rising from the dead means and everything like that, because, you know, they, they, but they do ask him a question about Elijah. See, having seen Elijah on the mountain, they reference the expectation of the scribes that Elijah must come first. Now this expectation was rooted in Malachi chapter 4 verses 5 and 6, which reads, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Based on that prophecy in Malachi, many expected Elijah, the actual Elijah, the prophet of the Old Testament, they expected Elijah to return and call for reconciliation prior to the judgment. Well, they asked Jesus this question about this expectation, and Jesus' answer alludes to Malachi chapter 4, verse 6. Uh, and Elijah's mission of restoration. He says two things about Elijah. Number one, he says Elijah has come. This is a reference to John the Baptist. Uh, Matthew 11 and Matthew 17 both tell us that Jesus, when they talk about Elijah, he was referencing uh, John the Baptist. Uh, but, but Elijah has come. And they did to him whatever they pleased. Now, in Malachi's prophecy, there is no mention of the coming Elijah suffering or dying. 
So we might think, well, wait, where, where does this, this, this tie in with John the Baptist and everything? Well, the trials by the historical Elijah of 1 Kings were a typological predecessor to John the Baptist. And if you think about it, they both, they both experienced some issues with a reigning king and the king's wife. Elijah had to deal with Ahab and Jezebel in 1 Kings 19, and John had his problems dealing with Herod Antipas and Herodias. Mark chapter 6, among other gospel accounts, tell us about uh, John the Baptist dealing with Herod Antipas and Herodias. But see, in the middle of talking about Elijah, though, Jesus talks about something much more important. Remember back in eight, chapter 8, verse 31, it says, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. So he's begun teaching them he must do the suffering. He must uh, be rejected and killed. But when we, when we come to chapter 9, verse 12, it says, And how is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt. There's that three-word phrase, it is written. His suffering is a matter of written prophecy. And again, the disciples don't understand this because all of their lives they've been taught if they would go to a temple service or a synagogue service or, or what have you, they, they were taught you know, the Messiah was coming and he was going to be this great king. They never were taught anything about the Messiah's suffering. Yet Jesus here says, you know what? It's in the prophecies. It's, it, it's been written. Now, do you remember that Peter wanted to put up three tents or shelters honoring Jesus, Moses, and Elijah? Yet something happens that prevents that. God comes down in the form of the cloud, and he speaks. Oftentimes, today, we wonder what God requires of us. What does God really want us to do? I mean, we're just one person. How can we do anything of any significance? Well, he doesn't want tents or shelters, etc., that are built in honor of you know, great men or women of, the, of faith in the past. Or he doesn't want even tents or shelters built in honor of his son. All God expects and wants of us is that we recognize His Son, we listen to His Son, and we obey His Son. That's what God requires of us. That's what God wants us to do. If we truly want to add to the honor and glory that Jesus so richly deserves, and if we truly want to behold His majesty and power in His kingdom, then we must be very careful to listen to what He Himself said, especially regarding His authority in passages such as Matthew 28, 18-20, where it says, And Jesus came to His disciples and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. See, what God wants us to do is to respect the authority of His Son. So can I ask you, are you respecting the authority of Jesus in your life? Because if you are, that's a wonderful way to live your life. But if you're not, then your life is going to be broken. You may not realize it. Everything may seem like it's going along just great for you. But your life is broken. That's the bad side. The good side, the good news, is that it doesn't have to stay broken. If you will bring to Christ your broken life, He can make it whole again. 
if you'll submit to his authority. Maybe you need to do that for the first time this morning by being immersed in the waters of baptism for the forgiveness of your sins. If so, there's no better time than right now and no better day than today for you to make that commitment. Or maybe your life has been broken and, and you've, you've made the commitment but you've sort of started to build tents over here for Moses and Elijah instead of focusing on Jesus. You can repent. You can repent and your life can be made whole again. Whatever that need that you have is to make your life whole again, God is the only one who can fix it. And so if your life is broken, I urge you to bring Christ your broken life. If we can help you through a public response to do that, won't you come to the front now as we stand and sing together?